Good evening, my name is Isabella, one of the volunteers of Bergamo Scienza. Before starting, we would ask for your attention and remind you that if you connect to the site bergamoscienza.it, clicking on the uh, live button, it is possible to follow and comment on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter the live event. Send in questions to speakers or invite your uh, friends and followers to follow the conference in streaming. Questions from the web are received by us volunteers and we will be selecting them during the debate in the room. For simultaneous translation, it is enough to scan the QR code that you find on the doors of the room or behind me. 
the QR code will address you to the Converso web app where you'll be able to select the translation language from the menu. To listen to the translation, you need a pair of headsets. Kindly use your own. If you were not to have them, you can ask the volunteers in the room. Please follow us on our Instagram profile where we will be talking about the festival and interacting you tagging us in your story. Please silence your electronic devices and participate in the initiatives of Bergamo Scienza. Thank you very much for the attention. Very well, so I think we can start this evening. Good evening to you all. Thank you very much for being here for this uh, wonderful and very interesting evening. Uh, uh, for Bergamo Scienza. My name is Luigi Ripamonti. I'm a journalist of the Corriere della Sera. I'd like to thank, first of all, Gianvito Martini, Martino and the organizers of Bergamo Scienza for having uh, wanted us here with you. I'm very honored, and I'm even more honored because tonight we have the enormous honor of having Craig Mello with us. A round of applause for Mr. Mello. Craig Mello has received a Nobel Prize in 2006, uh, together with Andrew Fries, uh, for a, a discovery that was absolutely fantastic, that of RNA interference. And he will be telling us what we mean by this, a discovery that is destined to radically change the prospects of medicine in the near future. Craig Cameron Mello, uh, American, Portuguese, and also a bit of an Italian origin as well. He got a degree in biochemistry at Brown University, then received his PhD from Harvard University, postdoc at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle. Faculty member at the University of Massachusetts Medical School since 1995, Howard Hughes Medical Investigator since 2000, and obviously Nobel Laureate. Now, why am I so honored and a bit nervous also to have Mr. Mello here. Well, I think I can say um, I'm quite ignorant, but I did develop some experience in my profession that um, I have the, imp the impression that I had meeting him is that I am in front of one of the Nobel laureates who really changed things. I can think of three of them, Fleming for penicillin, Kerry Mullis for PCR, and yes, of course, and Craig mellow for uh, RNA interference. Obviously, we also have Watson and Crick. They did do something in the end. I don't want to say no, but I mean, these three things really, in my perception as a scientific journalist, uh, mean um, that there was a before and there's an after. So what Mr. Mello invented is a technique which uh, is easy, simple, reproducible, relatively cheap, cheaper than others at least, to intervene in cells and do something that's very, very interesting as we will understand. One of the other things I was impressed with, apart from him, very low profile, very humble, very, very nice person, uh, somebody who really does not show off at all, like all important, truly important people. Well, I, one thing I was impressed by yesterday is this. This thing that we invented was a nice idea. We, I mean, biologists do these wonderful things. We did these wonderful things. But without chemists, we would have been able to do nothing. It would have just been a good idea, but we wouldn't have been able to put it in practice. So I thought about a proverb. If you want to go quick, you go on your own. If you want to move fast, if you want to move even faster, you have to do it with somebody else. So this is what Mr. Mello did, uh, surrounding himself with professionalities, different professionalities and skills that allowed this wonderful idea to become a reality. Now, before uh, the interview will start, uh, I'd like to start off with a question myself. Professor, where did you leave your motorbike? Because he's touring Italy on his motorbike. <laughs> Unfortunately, in Sardinia. <laughs> 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 but I have to say, Bergamo is the most beautiful city on the mainland. 
that I've seen so far, and I've been to Rome and Milan. Okay. Okay. Another short question before leaving the floor to the students. You once said that the most important discoveries come from passionate scientists that have, a, let's say, a true curiosity. When did you realize? When did you realize what you had done, and how did you feel when you started thinking? Well, will this lead me to maybe to Bergamo? But I mean, how did you feel about it when you realized what you had done? Well, first of all, I have to say that. The true joy of science is that as we learn more about the world, rather than making the world less mysterious, it actually makes the world much more mysterious. The more we learn, the more mysterious the world becomes. And that's true with every discovery. Um, so when we discovered I'm going to go slow because there's translation. They, they warned me. When we discovered RNA interference, at that time, there was no internet. There was no way of, you know, rapidly finding information. We had to look in an encyclopedia, <laughs> look in the back of the book, find the key word in the index and then flip to the page. I mean, it was crazy. It was really hard. There was no Google. There was no, you know, Yahoo or whatever to search for information quickly. And in fact, the internet really hadn't even been invented. That was in the early 90s, believe it or not. It was just... Uh, it was dark ages compared to now. Um, so what we discovered is that organisms use guided search. They already invented Google. They have it. Every one of us inside of our bodies, every single cell has a search engine that uses genetic information to find matching information and to regulate it. I was, I couldn't believe it. I thought it was, you know, first of all, I didn't know what it was. You know, it, it was new to me. Uh, you, you know, at the very same time, the company Google had just gone public and the stock price just kept going up. And I'm, I'm like, why is, why is this company worth anything? You know, it's like all it does is let you type word, a few words into a little window, and then it gives you a web page. I thought, that's crazy. How, how could they make money? Well, of course, they knew what I was just learning and what cells already knew. It's incredibly powerful when you can do, when you can read the queries, you know, that, that we all are making. You can understand what the what people are interested in or in the cell, you can understand what the cell is interested in by reading those queries. But more importantly, ultimately as a form of medicine, we learned uh, that we could use this natural mechanism to uh, do enter our own queries. We could make a synthetic guide or search query, like, just like you would type it into your web browser. We could make one in the laboratory and give it to a cell, and the cell would carry out the search for us and do this natural mechanism, find the gene that matches the query, and then regulate it for us. So um, it's, it was just amazing to be able to participate and, and to be part of that discovery, uh, and the excitement is still very much um, very much felt in the scientific world uh, by, by the opportunity that this presents to us to use guided search and genetics to treat disease.
It's very, very exciting. Thank you. Grazie, Professor Mello. A questo punto lascio la parola a voi. Thank you very much, Mr. Mello. And now the floor to you. Gaia, what would you like to ask Professor Mello? I'd like to challenge you. So, my question is this. How would you explain to an elementary school child what RNA interference is? Fortunately, most elementary school kids now already know about search, right? Because they use it themselves. Um, so I would, I would usually start with this Google analogy because it, it really is uh, important. The other thing is even an elementary school child should understand the language of the cell. The cell is, has a very, very simple language. It has four letters in the alphabet, just four. And it has only 21, 20 words, 20 total in the dictionary. The, the words are what we call the amino acids that are encoded by the DNA and the RNA. The RNA and the DNA, these are words that most people have heard but don't understand. DNA is a polymer. It's, a, it's, a, it's made up of what we, these letters, the four letters are arranged in our DNA. What makes a human different from a mouse is simply the order of the sequence. The se it's, like the, it's like writing a book. You know, the letters are ordered differently depending on what the book is about. That's how genetics works, except there's only four letters. And the four letters are used three at a time to spell those 20 words. It's, it's just truly amazing how simple it is. And the, the cell, so even a, a third grader can understand the language of the cell. And I think that's what is so great about what you guys are doing, is you're trying to make science more accessible to to young people. So I think we should be teaching our young people, you know, the wonders of science because I think we all as human beings are faced with just sort of the, the whole mystery of, of just being here in this amazing universe and thinking, where did I come from? What is, what am I for? You know, what is, what is my purpose? I think it's the human condition, and science is our effort to understand the answers to those questions. And as I said earlier, it just, there's no threat to religion because you deepen mystery when you understand the world better. You don't make the world less mysterious. What's, there's nothing mysterious about the Big Bang. I mean, nothing less mysterious about the Big Bang than any other creation myth. I mean, the, the idea that the universe formed from an explosion 13.7 billion years ago, um, I just find it wonderful to be alive and to have a chance to explore this universe. And the wonderful thing about kids, the little ones especially, is they get it. They understand that. And so I love to talk to little kids about science. And they ask the best questions, you know, they really do. So you got to take the time to talk to your three-year-old about just how wonderful it is, you know, point to the moon and say, tell them what it is, that what is that object in the sky? It's 240,000 miles away. I don't know how many kilometers that is, but it's, it's, it's pretty amazing, you know. So I love, I love that interaction with kids and it is a challenge, but it's, mostly because the language that we use has too many words that you know people just don't understand what is rna what is it what does it look like you know what is the molecule and it it's got you know these features to it that allow it to build that beautiful staircase helix you know rna can do that dna can do that because they are made out of these these beautiful stepping stones uh, that we call nucleotides that match up like lock and key and can form the sequence. And the beauty of it is that one strand 
can determine or essentially specify the matching strand exactly. So I think kids can, I think they can understand this. It's not that complicated. Unfortunately, we, we need, we really need to do a better job of educating people. And that's what I love about Bergamo because you're doing it. This, this is truly a unique festival that you have. I love it. I really love it. And I'm especially thankful to the kids, you guys, who make it happen. Maria Elena. Maria Elena. The floor is yours, but you're very emotional. I'd like to take a step backward and ask you, what were the projects you were working on when you got to this wonderful discovery and what uh, triggered the Eureka moment? Yes, so th the question is, uh, what was I working on? Um, and th that's a great question because usually the best discoveries are surprising. So you're not, actually, you're not actually working on what you discover until it sort of happens. <laughs> you know, it sort of falls into your hands and then all of a sudden, now you have this mystery, this new mystery. So when Andy Fire and I were getting to know each other as colleagues, we weren't working together in the same laboratory. We were actually competing with each other. We were both trying to do something that had never been done. We were trying to put DNA, genes, back into an animal because as any of you know who have you know, built anything or worked on a computer or a car, it's easy to break it. It's easy to make a mutation that makes it stop working. But it's really hard to fix it to put it back together, to put the pieces in so that it now works again. And so one of the things that was missing in the biology of animals was that we had no tools for putting genes back. We could make mutations, but we had no way of putting DNA and genes that were functional back into the animal. So I was working on that, and Andy was working on it, and we were kind of like, trying to beat each other. <laughs> you know, I was trying to do it, he was trying to do it. So we were like in a race, who's gonna win, right? So I tried like a hundred different things and he tried a hundred different things and nothing worked. So finally, after things weren't working, we started to call each other on the phone. Back then there was no email, so this is early 90s. And it's like, yeah, Andy, you know, I tried this and it didn't work. And he's like, well, did you try this? You know, you should, I tried this, you know. And so we started talking to each other and brainstorming together. And eventually, because of that, we got the DNA transformation. We call it DNA transformation because we're putting the DNA back, transforming, putting it back into the animal. We got it to work. And that was great because it was a very useful tool. And, um, you know, it was just the beginning of a, of a process where, you know, you had to use a, a needle, a very t the, the animals we were working on were very tiny. They're, I, I wish I had my slides I could show you, but they're small as a, a comma on a printed page. So they're microscopic worms. And, um, and so we were putting the DNA back into those little tiny animals by injection. And one of the things that was quite remarkable was that the animals would silence the DNA. So we'd put it in and it would maybe express briefly, but then it would just get shut off. So the animal was very sort of doing something strange. I mean, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't figure it out, to be honest. We just, it was actually annoying right, because we wanted the DNA we put in to be expressed and it kept getting silent. So anyway, long story short, that's what we were doing. And then uh, someone, uh, another laboratory, a good friend of mine, Ken Kemfuse, 
was trying to use um, the same procedure that we had developed for making DNA injection. They started to inject RNA for a different reason. Um, they were injecting RNA, and what they noticed was that when they injected RNA, they could induce a silencing effect that was quite surprising. Um, and uh, anyway, so Ken essentially told me about it, called me up, and I started exploring it. And I talked to Andy, and we started exploring the mechanism of this phenomenon. And what we discovered was that when we made, uh, it, was a, it was actually uh, a double-stranded RNA, and that, that's kind of another jargony term. But if you remember Watson and Crick, they have this beautiful staircase helix. There's two strands of DNA wrapped around each other that make this beautiful helical structure. RNA can make that too. And in fact, many viruses use a double-stranded RNA as their genome, their, you know, as part of their life cycle. Instead of DNA, they use RNA because really RNA and DNA are very simil mo similar molecules. I feel bad for the interpreters. I really do. I tend to be a little too wordy. I don't know. I'm trying to answer your question. Um, so the long story is we were working on DNA transformation, and then the surprising phenomenon occurred where the RNA injections using the same methodology started giving these really surprising results. And it turned out that these molecules of RNA that we were injecting, uh, some of them by chance were double-stranded, and that was the trigger that was triggering this incredible silencing phenomenon. Um, and I say it's incredible because, um, well, there's just so many things that were weird about it. Uh, RNA is a very unstable molecule compared to DNA. DNA is a much more stable molecule. It, it doesn't get degraded as quickly when you introduce it into cells. And yet, when I was teaching my student to do these experiments with RNA, I watched the student who'd never injected before accidentally inject the animal into the gut instead of the germline. And we knew that the, in order to get the silencing, the gene that was being expressed was in the germline, the, gon the gonad of the animal, and he missed. He injected into the intestine. And uh, despite the fact that he had missed, you know, I was being a, a nice professor, so I said, Nice try, you know, we'll check tomorrow, see if it worked, uh, thinking it wouldn't work. And of course it did, it still worked. Even though he had injected the RNA into the wrong part of the body, he got silencing uh, in the, the, uh, the germline of the animal. So it was an amazingly, surprisingly robust response. So the animal was responding to the injected material, and it was, it was like a... It was, an, it was clearly an active response. So we were giving information to the animal. The animal was taking the information and disseminating it throughout its body, like spreading it to, from one cell to another. And a, after the spreading of the information, it would then silence the corresponding gene that matched the information. So imagine that you could do this with the internet. You, you could make a search query in Google and search for a web page, and then your query would destroy the web page, so it would be gone. It'd be kind of nice if you could do it. Could you imagine if you, you know, maybe people can do that, some hackers can do it, but cells can do that. They can actually use a search query to find information and then destroy it. That's how they regulate gene expression of, at the level of the RNA. They don't destroy the RNA, I mean the DNA, the DNA copy is still there, so the gene could still be expressed in the future, but they destroy the RNA, which is like the software that's running in the cell. That's what's making your cell do stuff. It's like the RNA is really, that's the exciting part of the cell. That's the, you know, if, I, I got to say that when, to Watson once on the 50th anniversary of the double helix. He was in the audience and I, I got to say that RNA is 
much more interesting than DNA. Um, and it's true, the RNA is like the software that's running on your cell. That's why different cells in your body, even though they have the same DNA, they do very different things, right? Your intestinal cells do one thing and your neurons do another, uh, or at least that that's how it's supposed to work. <laughs> um, so anyway, we, were work we, we discovered this totally surprising phenomenon that we just, you know, couldn't believe was happening. Uh, there was something going on where, you know, the RNA that we were giving to the animal was triggering uh, like almost like an immune response, where the animal took the RNA, used it to search for the information that matched the RNA, and then eliminated it. And just think about the potential for that in disease. When you have a disease that's related to the expression of a gene that shouldn't be on, but is on or overexpressed at the wrong time, Imagine if you could just turn it off by giving a drug that mimics one of these little guides, these search queries that naturally exist in every cell. That's what we discovered. And it was you know, totally by accident that we discovered this. And if the, the only thing that we did that was smart was realize that we should work on it, right? Ken's lab, my friend Ken, who made the initial discovery, never followed it up. Andy and I both followed it up. We both kept working together, you know, in the same spirit as colleagues. And that was just really wonderful. It was really exciting. So, you know, that's, that's, what, that's what's fun about science. You just, you never know where you're going to end up. It makes life interesting every day in the life of a scientist is different. You know, ideally it's, you know, very different, you know, with exciting discoveries. Uh, you know, so that's, that's the fun of it. It's the fun, it's the fun of the surprise. Thank you, Professor. Then before leaving the floor to Ilaria, I have a question. Uh, couldn't we find a, a similar mechanism for fake news so that we could destroy all fake news in Google or in the Internet? It would be very nice for people like me, journalists. But now Ilaria has a very sophisticated question, it's a very serious one. I would connect back to what you said about the gene silencing. Instead of uh, injecting, you would take out genes from our code and books tell us that there are different systems that allow uh, these things, such as CRISPR, Cas9, or Talon. And these are uh, the latest discoveries in this field. Could we uh, compare the RNA interference with these two uh, systems in terms of how the way they work and, and the way they can be applied, CRISP, Cas9, and Talon? That's a great uh, question. The, the, uh, the techniques that, that she's referring to um, use, um, they actually target the DNA instead of the RNA. So the big difference is that with CRISPR, for example, you've got a search engine, protein. It's a protein that you know, carries out RNA interference. In the case of RNA interference, we call the protein an argonaut. In the case of the CRISPR system, we call the protein you know, various Cas number 9 or whatever, 12, 10, whatever. They're different Cas proteins because these are the things that carry out this, these are the proteins that hold on to the search query and uh, in both cases they use an RNA, a short RNA, about 20 nucleotides of, of sequence information is sufficient to find any sequence in the human genome. It's kind of like you only need to type in a few words into the Google search window to find anything on the web, right? You can find the play by Shakespeare, Macbeth, 
by typing to be or not to be. That's all you need, and you're going to find the whole thing. So cells do the same thing. Bacteria have this really uh, fascinating, wonderful search uh, and um, search mechanism that carries out guided search and regulates DNA by cleaving the DNA, and that's how it works. It cuts the DNA, and it's a powerful technique. It's wonderful, uh, and it's transformed uh, biology in the last um, almost 10 years, nine years now since the, the major discovery. Um, so I don't want to take anything at all away from it. CRISPR as a system, but it's got a lot of disadvantages for therapeutics. Mainly, the main disadvantage is that the, the catalytic, the enzyme that carries out the, the search doesn't exist in humans. So in order to use CRISPR therapy, we not only have to give the search query, we have to give the enzyme the Google doesn't exist in the human, so we take it from the bacteria, and we have to give the human the CRISPR protein, or the gene that expresses the CRISPR protein, and then the human cell can do this guided search, and then it will find the target, make the cut, and you can do various things now that, that change the DNA. You can also do RNA editing. Uh, you can do editing using the DNA uh, CRISPR system as well. It, there's a lot of wonderful things you can do, but the big disadvantage is that humans don't have that particular type of search engine. Humans have argonauts. They have several of them in, their, in our genome. We have these enzymes which will take a, an RNA guide and carry out a search for RNA. And so the nice thing about our RNA interference mechanism is that it, it's already working in all of our cells. So all we have to do is deliver this short RNA molecule, and once it gets into the cell, it can carry out the search for us without the need for anything additional. The, you know, there's other things, I don't want to get too technical, but basically RNA interference is taking advantage of a natural mechanism with an, a short query as the drug, and there are already approved drugs in humans based on the the technology. There are approved, approved CRISPR therapies as well. Or, uh, they're moving along even uh, now. They've been tested and working in the human. But um, I think the promise of, of the RNA interference mechanism is really that it's already working in all of our cells. So all we have to do is make these guides and uh, we have a drug that will target a gene. I hope that answers your question. Grazie, professore. Alice, tocca a te. Uh, Alice, it's up to you. I have a question which is a bit more general. Uh, so it's a bit different from the ones that have been asked up to now. Today, we are called to meet and address challenges that can be faced only thanks to science. Let's think about the pandemic, uh, climate change, uh, the energy crisis, diseases such as cancer. But I think that to tackle these problems, it's very important to have a mass scientific culture that we still do not have. Now, do you think that uh, a Nobel laureate can also have the role of becoming like a science witness and help spread this um, scientific mass culture and how y your daily life has changed after receiving the Nobel Prize? I love that question. It's a great question. Um, it's a I think there's a good answer. You know, I, I don't think it's that complicated. Um, one of the things that I think is so beautiful about science is that I don't think, it, you know, science is just the way, it's, it's just another word for the way that people learn things, right? And it, everybody is a scientist. Everybody who learns anything is a scientist. And ultimately, what's so beautiful about science, and I just want to like say, say a quote from Richard Feynman, which I think is so wonderful. He says, he'd rather have questions that he can't answer than answers that he can't question. 
And I, I think that's Richard Feynman, he's, he's a very funny guy, uh, wrote some several beautiful books for a lay audience. I encourage people to read his books because it's a good window into the sort of the scientific mind, if you will. But the, the point is that what scientists do, what science does, and I think it's just the way that humans learn. It's, it's how we have always learned. It's how everything about human culture ever got figured out. It's how the horse got domesticated. It's how the wheel got invented. It's how the first crops, you know, like corn and wheat, got domesticated. It's by doing this very simple process. Gather information, test it out, and try to use it to disprove what you believe. For example, if you think it's not safe to ride a horse, try to ride a horse, right? See if it's safe. See if you can make it safe. Maybe you can make it safe. Maybe you'll die. <laughs> but, but that's science, right? You try stuff and you gather all the information. So it's, it's actually really simple. What people are doing wrong is they're taking what they believe and then they're searching for information that supports what they believe. They're just using the, the whole, all of this information, you know, I thought information should be liberating because I'm a scientist. The way I use information is I gather the information and I try to use it to disprove what I believe. That, that's how I learn new stuff. And when I disprove something I believe, I have learned something. It's great, it's exciting. I've, my whole career, everything, every good thing I ever discovered was because I disproved something that I believed. It's how you learn stuff, it's how everybody learn stuff. I mean, there was a time when everybody, everybody would have said, it's not safe to ride a horse. Stay away from horses because you'll get killed. They'll kick you or whatever. But somebody decided to go and try to disprove that theory, and they succeeded. This is how humans learn stuff. So it's, it's nothing new. It's just that we're living in this weird information age where we're inundated with information and, and somewhere along the line, nobody taught our, our average person how to handle it. Information is dangerous. It's really dangerous stuff. You should not believe it, especially, especially if you like it. Like if, if, you, if it's appealing to you, if you, if you like what you just heard, you should not believe it. You should be scared of that because it's dangerous. People will tell you stuff that they think you will like to hear. Come on, people. Don't you think, I mean, don't you think that it should be obvious? It's like in, in I don't know who it was, P.T. Barnum said, no one ever lost any money by underestimating the intelligence of the American <laughs> citizen. And, and it's true. We really have to be more careful about handling information because it's dangerous. So don't believe anything and you're a scientist. Somebody tells you you can't ride a horse, go ride the horse. That's what scientists do. That's why I, I love what you guys are doing because that's what this is all about. It's about young people who already know that they shouldn't really believe mom and dad, they, they kind of know it. They know mom and dad might be wrong, but sometimes they're afraid to like rebel enough to sort of try to prove them wrong. And sometimes mom and dad are right, so don't, don't get too carried away. But uh, yeah, that's what it's all about. And I, I really don't think it's that complicated. In fact, I'm very surprised you know, like that, that people in the United States, so many of them believe the election was stolen. What a joke. I mean, it's so obvious that it was not stolen. 
There, <laughs> anyway, don't get me started. <laughs> and, and, and so people are t are, don't know how to handle information. Information should never be trusted. It should always be questioned. And if, as long as you're doing that, as long as you're questioning information, the thing that's beautiful about that is it brings people together. It's a unifier, not a divider. You start believing information, you've immediately become a divided because someone over here might not believe it. Then you're divided. But if you're both questioning it, if you're both trying to kick the tires and disprove it, you're on the same team, right? If you believe the election was stolen, I have no problem with that. Prove it to me. Show me the data, right? That's fine. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to say, no, you couldn't possibly be right. I'm going to say, show me the data. That's what scientists do, you know? They want to... Anyway, long answer to a great question, and I love all your questions. You just are very... It's very inspirational to, to hear your, your ideas. Grazie, professore. Jacopo, your turn. I hope I can rise to the occasion. I mean, it's... Well, anyways, I want to go back to what has been said in the answer to the first question. That is the concept of science as a, a wonder, a constant discovery, the awe, the, the amazement, the wonder of this discovery. I admit that for me, this is true. Science has always made me curious and still fascinates me now. What I would like to ask you is this. Um, would you have any tips, any pieces of advice on how to transmit science, not only the important scientific concepts, but this wonder, uh, this passion? Is there any way that can be, that you find useful, a uh, good way to convey this? And another thing is how can we do this? I mean, how can we make science, let's say, more pleasant, more appealing? without obviously neglecting something, without risking to, let's say, to forget uh, complicated concepts as well, which are important. That's, that's another really great question. And, uh, you know, the, the real challenge with science education is that science is about doing. You know, it, the horse riding example is a great, is a great one, right? You got to do the experiment. You can't just sit there and look at the horse and try to figure out if it's possible to ride the horse. You got to go do it, right? So the way you really learn science is by doing science. And I think one of the things that we should be doing is getting our younger kids engaged in science in more meaningful ways um, at an earlier age, so that they get to experience the discovery process. Um, and I do think that a lot, of, a lot of educators are trying to do that, and, and not just doing experiments that have already been done and repeating them in the laboratory, but um, maybe doing something totally new. Um, there's, there are a really great, you know, uh, I forget the name of the group, but I think they call it the phage hunters. They basically go out and they dig up soil and then the kids come back to the laboratory and they t take the, the soil and they put it onto bacteria and if there's a virus in there that can infect the, the bacteria, it will, it will kill the bacteria in, in the place where the virus was put down into the, the petri dish and you'll get this little circle where all the bacteria are dying, and then you can take the, the cells from there and you can put them under a microscope where you can do PCR in various techniques that are, that are available, and you can actually identify the virus. You know, some, things like that, where the kids get their hands on discovering something new. The thing that's so remarkable about that is almost every time they discover a virus, it's something totally new. It's a virus that nobody has even ever named yet. There's so many viruses out there, it's kind of scary. Um, 
So getting kids engaged in science, I think getting hands-on is great. Trying to figure out ways of breaking the jargon barriers. You know, we, we use so much jargon in science. You know, getting them simplifying the concepts, and I, and I don't have the answer for that. You know, I think some level of knowledge is necessary, so uh, it, it's unfortunate that we have to teach kids, you know, all of this, you know, terminology. But I do think what they'll, they'll learn it better if they're doing. Um, and I've, I've seen people come in my own lab who have had no experience with science and just after a few weeks, they're so eager that they're reading the book, the textbooks, they're, they're researching on their own to understand better what they're doing. So I, I really think the key is getting kids with their hands on the experiment. Alice, I think you have a question that follows on Giacomo's one. Yes, going back to what he was saying, I was thinking about the scientist and the stereotype that you have of scientists. So normally you see him or her as an introvert, a bit of a loner, only committed in his own research and very focused on his or her studies. Now, this stereotype, could it possibly discourage young people from thinking of pursuing a career in science? Is it so utopian to, to hope that in the future the, there will be, uh, you know, children who would like to become Craig Mello, just as many children as the ones who would like to become Cristiano Ronaldo? <laughs> well, he's Portuguese, by the way, I'd like to remind you. He knows, he knows Ronaldo well. Of course. Uh, yeah, that's a great, another great question. But I think, you know, a, a lot of kids don't have any um, direct interaction with scientists. So I think w if they did, they would learn that scientists are just like every, everyone else. You know, there's such diversity. There's very charismatic scientists. There are very introverted scientists. They're just like everybody else. Scientists, I mean, I, I believe everybody is a scientist at some level because we all learn stuff, right? And the only way you can learn stuff is using the scientific method. That's it. There's only one way you learn anything, and that's by testing your ideas, right? So I don't think it's the, I think the problem is that most kids never meet a scientist, you know? They don't know how cool it is to be a scientist. I mean, people will pay you to go to college in the United States they will pay you to go to college to get a PhD because there are, there's a shortage of scientists in the world. So kids in the audience, maybe some of you guys, if you wanted to come work in my lab, we will pay you to come to America to work in our labs. We need scientists. Um, and the fact is science is fun. I know really cool scientists and they dance up a storm, they have a great time, they, drink beer, <laughs> you know, some of them smoke pot. <laughs> I don't I mean not that that's a good thing necessarily, but it's, it's, you know, it's not just like every other profession. It's, it's, you know, scientists are real people and they, you know, I think kids need to see how much fun it is to be a scientist. You know, it's, it's a really, really fun career because basically you're just playing all day long and somebody pays you to do it. And it, it doesn't pay a lot of money. You know, maybe you have to jump through a lot of hoops to get there, but it's a great career. And I think a lot of kids, you know, I know from my own experience that a lot of kids in my lab never had an interaction with a scientist and it was just some lucky chance or a good teacher that they ended up doing a summer internship and finding out that they really liked it, you know, so. Yeah, that's a great question. Jacopo, tu so che Jacopo, you could insist a little bit if you wanted on this idea of the stereotype, right? 
Yes, um, yes, I'd like to go on with these uh, questions, existential questions about science. And I would like to um, ask you this or tell you this. There is often this feeling towards science of inadequacy, of feeling lost. Very often we see science as something that's unattainable, that's too big for us. And this happens to young people, especially at the first years of university, this reverential fear for the professor, for instance. Uh, the reference professor that maybe and maybe you know students may be discouraged to to go one step further so how do you think that this problem can be managed in what way yeah i mean i think you know you're asking a really good question because the question really is how do you how do you inspire kids to uh, you know i mean one of the sort of the bad things about scientists is that sometimes we're not the best teachers. You know, they're just like any other profession. They're, it's first of all, being a good teacher is like a whole profession just in itself. And usually, when you're a scientist, you're selected for your success as a scientist, not for your success as a teacher. The only time you start teaching is after you've already been successful enough to get a job as a, te as a scientist with your own laboratory, right? So unfortunately, we need to do a better job of educating science teachers from among our scientists and, and from among our non-scientists as well. There may be really good science teachers who are not actually doing science themselves and we need to and we are I, we actually are there's a lot a lot of effort going into improving science teaching and one of the things that I think scientists do that well science teachers do wrong is they they discourage kids who are passionate about science but are bored like if you're if you're in a biology class and you're learning the parts of the cell but you're interested in crispr and you don't want to learn about the endoplasmic reticulum you know or you know whatever the electron transport chain you want to study crispr you know a teacher a good teacher would say here read about crispr go ahead and then you can tell the class about it, you know? And I think I had some teachers that did that, you know, when I was bored with what was being taught, um, maybe because I knew that subject pretty well and I, f I felt it was dull. They, they gave me something else, you know? They said, what about this? You know, you're interested in this, read more about it. So we need to be more creative, uh, you know, and I, I don't have the all the answers at all. I'm just saying that I think a lot of effort is going into that. So I do think, again, I think that's solvable. And, uh, you know, I, I would encourage all of you who are interested in a science career, don't be discouraged by the fact that you have to memorize and learn a, a lot of material because the fun part of science is right at the very cutting edge of it, of the science. Like, in order to be a scientist studying CRISPR, you really don't have to know all that other stuff. I mean, it's, fa it's true. You don't have to know anything except the sort of like enough to interpret tomorrow's experiment, right? That's all you really need to know. It's kind of wonderful. It's kind of, you can even like, and we all do, you know, you forget a lot of the other biology that you learned in school because you're not using it every day in your laboratory, right? You don't have to know all that stuff. And yet when we're teaching our kids, we try to cram it all into their head, thinking that that will make them a good, stu a good scientist in the future or prepare them for becoming a medical doctor. In reality, we're just boring the heck out of the kid, discouraging them from the whole field. And so it's, uh, it's unfortunate. We need to do a better job of, of that. Thank you, Professor Marilena. I had something to add. 
was in this field. Yes, indeed. The very last words that uh, you mentioned were sort of speech to me because I'm very much interested in research and uh, connecting back to what you said before that uh, being a scientist can be uh, fun, uh, you drink beer, you can smoke, pots, all the things that young people are interested in. Uh, but uh, uh, you need a lot of patience and a lot of time. Did you ever uh, feel frustrated, disappointed? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, uh, discouragement. The battery is dying. Okay. I turned the volume all the way up, and now I can hear you. I, I think the question is about whether I was frustrated as a scientist. Yeah. I, I think uh, one, one of the, the, the funny things I experiences I have had as a scientist is that often when you think that you're having bad luck, it's actually really, really good luck. You know, there, there have been times when I was very frustrated as a scientist because my experiments didn't work or had become seemingly impossible <laughs> for, for whatever reason. You know, just it seemed like really bad luck. And um, one, one of the things that's so wonderful about science is if you persevere and you get through that, quite often you'll end up looking back on that obstacle that you had to overcome and you'll realize that you know that's what really made you that's what really made all these new discoveries possible um and uh, i'm trying to th you know think of a, a good way of giving an example of that well one example i already gave is is that andy and i were trying to introduced DNA back into the animal and we couldn't do it. We were failing. It was very frustrating. But that was the genesis of this collaboration that turned out to be so fruitful and that led to, you know, these other very, very exciting discoveries. And in part, that wouldn't have been possible if we had just, you know, been lucky and it had worked right away, then, you know, it would have maybe never happened that we had that that spirit of collaboration and, and started to work together. And there were other, there were many other examples during, during my career that are hard to explain because of the technicalities, you know, the frustrating aspect of the, the technical obstacles that I had to overcome. But it's very, I think it's just human nature. It's very, very satisfying to solve a problem. Right? So you, if you had no problems in your life, if you never had to overcome anything, maybe you're not a very strong person because you never had to sort of suffer. <laughs> you know what I mean? So as a scientist, I think that the frustration and having the motivation and the, the passion necessary to overcome the frustration, to keep working despite the failures, that's what ultimately makes you, it's, it makes you happy. It makes you happy because you finally succeeded. Um, and so I would encourage all of you who are doing science, because we always hit these hard times when experiments don't work, um, just keep going and, and uh, keep trying new things. It, because, you know, if this experiment doesn't work this way, Maybe you have to try it a different way. And that's when the, the you know, when you're forced to be more creative, that's when you make a, a breakthrough. And, and that's what I've experienced. It's, just, it's actually a lot of fun to have those setbacks. Um, in, it's always fun, but only in retrospect, right? Fine. Uh, now, Gaia has a very interesting question. We spoke about uh, research through Mariela's question and also about the future. I have a question on the future of research and its consequences. As of today, uh, 
pathogenic uh, gene uh, therapies is used only in certain fields. What could be the uh, hindrances that could be overcome by research and medicine to find new uh, treatment target thanks to RNA interference and all what followed after the discovery? Um, I think I understand the question. Um, the future of medicine is extremely bright, and it's for the following reason. We now have genetics, we, you know, another piece of jargon, the genome. We have DNA sequence for, for people, individual people, including people who are sick. We read their genetics, their genetic code. We, do, we determine the nucleotides sequence, that four letters. We determine it for that human being. And we can find the, the reasons why they are sick, the mutations that make them sick. Also, if someone is healthier than normal, they don't get sick, they live to be 100 and they can still run a marathon, we sequence those people, we determine their genes, and we find out which genes they have that are making them healthier than normal. So we're learning to, we're beginning to understand the underlying genetic basis, the, the reason at the level of the language of the cell, we're learning what makes you healthier or sicker than normal. And we have tools like RNA interference, gene therapy, CRISPR, that enable us to fix information that's broken, to correct it, or to change it. For example, if someone is healthier than normal because they don't have a gene that, that all of us normally have, something that actually makes you have, for example, high cholesterol. This is actually a drug that was just developed. It just got approved in Italy based on this. It's a search query that targets a gene that's mutated in people that normal health, you know, normal people turn out some of them are healthier than normal because they have really low cholesterol levels. They never get heart disease. They never have, you know, heart attacks. And it's because they have a mutation in this gene. So a company decided to make a, a guide RNA, a, a search query, and give it to these to patients to, to see if they could lower the activity of that gene in normal people that, nor that have a good copy of that gene. And sure enough, it worked. It lowers the cholesterol level so much that these patients are uh, exhibiting really, really healthy levels of, of the LDL cholesterol, which causes all the cardiovascular problems. Um, and so there's already a, a new approved drug that's based on exactly this concept of genetics, right? So you learn about the genetics of, of people, and everybody is participating, you know, by, because, you know, personally, you want to know why, you know, why am I getting sick? And, and, you know, kindly, the people who are healthier than normal are like, yeah, you can sequence me and find out why I'm so healthy, that's fine. But we're learning so much now about the genetics of health and disease, and we have tools that enable us to, uh, to change gene expression, to uh, create, uh, you know, to essentially create changes that help people. And that's really, really exciting. Um, it's, it's transforming medicine and, and it's going to make hopefully lots of lots of, uh, you know, very, very important uh, breakthroughs in the future for human health. So. Grazie, professore. Bene, abbiamo... Thank you, professor. There are still some minutes, there's some time for questions uh, from the audience, uh, from the floor, anybody? I'd like to ask uh, 
Professor Mello uh, about uh, this technique. Uh, you spoke about this technique that could be silencing some genes that are overexpressed. Could it make uh, uh, genes e expressed when they do not express, when, when they are not expressed? So the opposite. So I, th I think the question is, can you turn a gene on or are you limited to only turning the gene off? That's a great question. Uh, the answer is that you can, there are ways of, of turning genes on using RNA interference by, for example, inactivating a negative regulator of a gene. It's, it's like an indirect way, uh, but, the, but the, this type of drug works best in directly inactivating gene expression. It's a silencing pathway mainly. It's not an activating pathway. However, you know, there are ways around that because there are many genes that regulate other genes. So you can take a, a, a you can target a gene that turns, normally turns a gene off. And when I tur turn off the negative regulator, now the gene comes on. So there are ways around it, but that, that's a great question. And um, one of the limitations of RNA interference is that it mainly is a way of interfering, of stopping. So if you want to repair a gene, replace it, you might need to use something called gene therapy, where you take a copy, a good copy of the gene, and you give it back. You put it back into the, the person. Um, and that's also possible. It's a, it's a type of therapy that's already working. And in fact, it was one, one of the therapies that was first tested and developed here in Italy, and, and uh, so it's, it's a very exciting tool. And in fact, that's what Andy and I were working on, you know, putting DNA back into the animal is the way, it's the sort of a straightforward way of fixing a broken gene is to actually fix it, right? But with RNA interference, we can turn off a gene that might be overexpressed or is causing or contributing to disease through its expression. So it's great because, you know, this is what I was saying, we have lots of tools now. It's not just one thing, it's using all of the tools that we have that are enabling this real revolution in medicine. Are there other questions? Good evening. I have this question when speaking about RNA. I have a lot of doubts on RNA in Bergamo. RNA was the focus of our attention because uh, we just uh, heard about uh, RNA viruses and gene products based on RNA. And we heard the two different interpretations on how this virus developed. The first explanation that was given and that is being adopted today is that in a fish market in one China, a fight amongst two pangolins or two bats triggered the formation of a new virus that took the opportunity for a spillover. Hence, the virus of uh, COV-2. But they also told us a different thing. They told us that in Wuhan, simultaneously, there was a laboratory where emerging diseases are being studied. And when there was a director, she's in Lee, uh, probably this is her name. Uh, anyway, uh, together with a uh, US uh, researcher, she is studying bat viruses, uh, so much so that uh, she is called the bat woman. A lot of research has been carried out, and it seems that uh, uh, 
a recombinant DNA, a virus, sorry, might have escaped this laboratory. Uh, given that I'll never get a chance to speak with a person who is so uh, capable and so knowledgeable in RNA, I will never have this opportunity to ask a question. And also, I would like to thank you for this. Uh, I appreciated the fact that you said that science is based on uh, denial of the news information we are given, uh, because science, uh, I believe, could also be defined as a scientific methodology. So science is uh, the method, scientific methodology. Thank you very much, anyway. Great, I got it. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I, I remember the, um, the sort of the controversy over the origin, and we had sort of Donald Trump uh, calling it the China virus and, you know, sort of using it politically and, and unfortunately. The fact is that despite the possibility, and I admit totally it's completely possible that the virus escaped from a laboratory, absolutely. I have no, no problem with that possibility. Um, but on the other hand, it's also can totally reasonable that laboratories all over the world are studying viruses like this because um, the first SARS virus was tracked, I believe, uh, the story is, to a pig farmer who had a fruit tree in his farm where the bats were eating the fruit and putting droppings onto the ground that, the, that were then being eaten by the pigs and they were able to trace the bat virus to the pigs and then the pig spread it to the farmer and the farmer got sick and died and then, you know, that virus, that version of COVID, SARS-1, was so deadly that it fizzled out. It basically was killing 80% of the people who got infected. So this time, who cares? You know, like, say a, a scientist accidentally re released this virus. Sooner or later, that virus was going to get released. And the, trust me, the variety and the, the, you know, there are so many viruses out there. It's going to happen again, sadly. And it's going to happen again and again and again. So why are we still here? We're here because the viruses need us. Believe it or not, I'm not kidding. The only reason there are human beings on the surface of the planet is that viruses need us to colonize land. If it weren't for humans and other animals, there'd be nothing but like, you know, slime, mold, or, you know, cells in the ocean. Seriously, viruses are part of the, the ecosystem within which we all live. We've evolved with viruses. Our genome is 50% viral DNA, you know, in one shape or form or another. You are always, everyone in this room is infected by viruses constantly, all the time. And sometimes they're really, really, really bad viruses like COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, whatever they call it. Or, and sometimes they're just, you know, run-of-the-mill average viruses. There's a, there's a funny movie, not funny, a sort of horrifying movie called Contagion, I think it is, where they're talking about an outbreak of influenza like bird flu. And the, the um, military guy sitting across from the, from the scientist says to the scientist, could this be weaponized? And the scientist says, yes, the birds are already doing that. And that's really the truth is bats, think about bats. They are a communal organism. They live in caves. They're in groups of thousands and thousands of animals. And they're one of the few mammals that do that, that live in huge groups. So they are perfect places to cultivate viruses that spread by aerosol because they live together inside enclosed spaces. And so it's not at all surprising that a bat virus would become this pandemic 
that it was spread by aerosol and therefore extremely dangerous and, and you know. So whether it was a, escaped from a laboratory accidentally, even, trust me, you don't need humans to, you know, and if a human tried to make this virus bad, it, they'd probably botch it up. It wouldn't, it'd be much less effective than it was uh, in nature, right? I mean, it's not easy to make a, a virus. Viruses are shaped by evolution over millions of years, and they're really, really good at what they do, and there are just so many of them. So my answer to you, and I, I don't, know the answer. I don't know whether it escaped from a lab. I don't know whether it was uh, engineered intentionally by the Chinese government. I mean, that would be crazy if they did it. Uh, and trust me, if they did something to the virus to manipulate it, they'd make it less fit, not more fit. So humans, we're not, we're not that smart at engineering life. We're really not. When we mess around with living things, we usually make them less fit. You know, corn, for example, was domesticated by hundreds and hundreds of years of selection. Corn cannot grow in the wild. It needs to be cultivated by humans because we've made it less fit. So again, even though I admit that it's possible that scientists made this virus, I think it's much more likely that the bats made it and that it escaped either from a laboratory or from a food stand and jumped to humans. And that's the, the fear that we all have to face. Bats are incubating viruses right now that are probably way worse than this one. And it, it's not at all impossible that we will all be, you know, and I mean all of us, lining up again to get vaccinated, e eagerly hoping to be vaccinated because of another pandemic. So we're very fortunate that we have the ability to make vaccines now quickly using mRNA, which is a different kind of RNA than what we were talking about today. But mRNA vaccines wonderfully can be designed quickly as soon as, you know, in fact, uh, within about 30 days after the first person was infected uh, or died, from COVID-19, we had the sequence of the virus. And because of the technology that had already been developed in laboratories around the world, we were able to synthesize the RNA for the virus, encapsulate it so that it could be delivered into the, the muscle of a human and thereby create this, this vaccine. That was, it was easy to put that together within three months of the first, you know, the first person dying, we already had the RNA ready to go into humans to vaccinate them. Of course, we had to ramp up production, but we'll be ready for the next one. That's the good thing. The bad thing is the next one could be a lot worse. This one was bad, but you know, just think of how horrible it was. You know, some of you might be old enough to remember polio when it was an ep epidemic, it's still in the world. Um, but polio was scary because it killed our children. Um, and uh, this one fortunately spared our children. I mean, I'm a parent. I think many of you who are parents know you don't mind risking yourself, but if it's your child, uh, that's a different matter. And, and so I think we're lucky uh, that we're now more prepared and I hope we can stop worrying about who's to, who to blame for this pandemic um, and, and, and instead try to collectively learn from it so that we're ready for the next one and there will be a next one. There are just too many people. I mean, that's sadly one of the things that science is telling us is that you know, we're burdening this planet with humanity. There's too many people we're destroying we're not, we're not living sustainably, and we're, we're encroaching on animals. You know, people, the animals losing their environment, they're losing their space, and because of that, people are in more contact with animals that can then spread viruses to the animals. We're also cultivating animals in unsafe ways, you know, with our chicken farms and so on. 
So we have to be more careful and we have to be smarter and we need a lot of scientists to help us solve our problems. Um, so, you know, I think it's a, it, it, I hope I, I didn't like offend you at all in that answer. I mean, I, I actually really don't care where the virus came from. Um, and I, I feel like that's how we should all feel about it. You know, that if, the, if it was a, an escape from a laboratory, that's unfortunate, but the reason the laboratory exists is to try to prepare us for the next virus that's going, you know, to try to make sure that we know sort of what viruses are out there that might be spreading, that might jump next into humans. Um, so I, I feel like um, we need to respect that. Um, anyway, I, I think it's a sensitive question, but uh, I hope that that helps answer it for you. Very well, time flies, but uh, we would like to, cl we have to close, and we would like to close with something that we hopefully you will like. Uh, I said the proverb, who wants to go far has to go with somebody. If you want to go, f uh, you, 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 you went very far and you brought us very far, but you like speed, not only because you drive a motorbike, but even because he's very affectionate to this female mythological person who went very rapidly that you know very well in this city. So to close this evening, please, uh, Jacopo, if you can do what you're about to do. <laughs> uh, this is from our Bergamo's football team, the Atalanta. As, as many of you may know, our company called Atalanta <laughs> is making therapeutics to treat Alzheimer's disease and ALS that are based on the search queries that I told you about. And, the, and there, we named Atalanta, our company, after the same goddess, the Atalanta, who is so fast because we can make drugs fast just like your football team is going to win the championship this year. So, <laughs> thank you. So at this point, we can say that Mello is uh, from Bergamo, practically he's a Bergamo citizen, ad honorem. And I'd like to thank everybody.